In this video, I'll be demonstrating some translations from abstract logic into idiomatic English. Now you can see from the instruction here, translate the following symbolic sentence into an idiomatic English sentence using the abbreviation scheme provided. Now what do we mean by idiomatic? Well, I mean an English sentence that you would actually say in a conversation. So if you look at this, what we're going to be trying to do is take this logic and turn it into an English sentence, sort of like the opposite of a standard symbolization question. But what I'm looking for is something that's not just what I would call logic ease. Like you can't just translate that by saying there is something that's a G and blah, 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 and there is something Y that is a G and blah, blah, blah. Like you actually have to think about what this says, figure out the key relation, and write it out in a sentence that essentially captures the meaning. The trick to doing these types of translations is to actually abstract away from the details and see if there's a form that you recognize. A lot of symbolization in multiplex predicate logic is very repetitive, which is why you get these really long statements. Uh, but that repetition really clues you in into what is trying to be said. So take a look at this sentence here. Now I'm going to pretty much ignore the uh, symbolization scheme right now. And what I'm going to try and do is just figure out what sort of pattern this is. And once I appreciate the pattern, then I can plug in the details and figure out how to s type it out. So here it says there is something, that's a G, okay, and it stands in this complicated three-place relationship F. So I see that there's a BB, uh, a W, which is my existential, and then the name letter D. So the first slot of F is a name letter or operation, BB, and then the third slot is a name letter D, and the middle slot is just this uh, G, whatever that is. Okay. Now it also says there's another G or a G uh, that's a Y, and it has the same relation. There's the BB, there's the D, and the Y, and immediately I get W doesn't equal Y. So I don't really know what's going on in terms of the details, but I know immediately that I invoked I've invoked at least two different things here that stand in this F relationship. Okay? And now I say, for all M, if GM and FBB MD, so if there's another G that is stands in this three-place relationship to BB and D, then M is W or M is Y. Then M is the first thing or M is the second. Now, when you piece this all together, it is really just saying the following. Here's something that stands in this relationship. Here's something that's different than the first that stands in the relationship. And if anything stands in the relationship, it's the first or the second. What this is trying to capture is the relationship of exactly two. Exactly two what? Well, we'll figure that out in a second, but I just want to go over why this is exactly two. Here's one thing. Here's another thing that's not the first, so that's two. And this says anything that has this property is the first or the second, so that's exactly two. At this point, I can just fill things in. G is a game. Okay, so I'm talking about exactly two games. And then what's the property? Ooh, played on blah, blah, blah. Well, I just have to figure out my operation. B of B is the brother of Ben. D is Monday. So reading from the big predicate outwards, this says um, Ben's brother played exactly two games, because that's what the W, Y's are, on, there's the on, and then the last one is D, Monday. And that's how we do an abstract translation. You really just want to focus on the repetitive pattern and fill in the details later. Notice I didn't even care what the details were of F until the very end when I had to actually read out the sentence. Here's another example. So uh, again, I'm just going to sort of ignore the details here. I'm just going to look at this really big repetitive sequence. And you can just glance at it and see that it's very repetitive. So here I have if anything is an A, and it stands in this capital B relationship, then if anything is an A and it stands in the capital B relationship, then if anything is an A and it stands in the capital B relationship, then if anything is an A and it stands in the capital B relationship, well, this last thing, the fourth thing, either equals X or it equals Y or it equals Z. 
So the fourth thing either e equals the first, second, or third. So this is, again, a type of pattern that you've seen before in your symbolization. It says, if one, then if this, then if that, then if this, the fourth thing must be one of the first three. So this is a repetitive sequence that represents at most three. Um, notice it's not actually saying uh, at least three or exactly three or anything like that. At most three could be that there are none, because if this first antecedent is false, then the entire conditional is just true. So this says at most three. Now, what about this uh, sort of has the properties of it being at most three? Well, we just have to focus in on the big relationship, which is the capital B. I can see I have an operation right there, which is B of D. So B of D, I'm just taking notes for myself, is the right wrist of Dario. And I'm ready to go. So this says the right wrist of Dario. And then I go back to the B2 predicate, broke in. And then A is my X, which is a place. And I already know the relationship is at most. So this just says at most three places. So the at most relationship just says if one, if an X, if a Y, if a Z, if a W, then W has to equal one of these three. That means at most three. And uh, it's very repetitive, so you don't want to get too caught into the details when you translate it too much. Another translation. Uh, so this one says there is something that's a D, H, and stands in this H2 relationship to A. Okay. Now we have the, that was a Y, this is a Z that does the same thing, and notice it doesn't equal the first. And this is a W that does the same thing, and notice it doesn't equal uh, the first or the second. So right off the bat, we can recognize this as saying uh, that there are um, at least uh, three things. Why? Because this one, the Y is one, the Z is one, and the W is one. And notice that the Y, the y doesn't equal the Z, the Z, and the W doesn't equal the first two, so there's at least three. But it also says here, it's not the case that there is an X, and notice it's the exact same repeated pattern, such that X doesn't equal Y, X doesn't equal Z, and X doesn't equal W. So this says at least three things, and not another. So, of course, when you put this all together, this just says exactly three. So what is the property, sorry, what does the exactly three thing refer to? Again, you just focus on the big multiplace predicate in the repeated pattern, which is H A Y. A is test four, and then H two is has, and then we are off to the races. So I can say test four has exactly three what? Uh, D H tricky questions. And that's it. So we've been looking at translations that have uh, a lot of quantities in them, but don't forget, I can really ask you a translation on any sort of long complicated form that we've seen. So uh, let's see if we can recognize the pattern in this one as well. This says there is an F and H X A. Okay, fine. So there is something that has this property. And for all Y, F Y and H Y A, and x doesn't equal y. So for anything that's different from the first, then g x y. Now you should recognize this quite quickly as the form of a superlative, uh, because it's basically saying uh, some f that is g to all others. And so I'm going to have to sort of pad that out later. Okay, well, um, I guess I can pad it out now and figure out the superlative. So F is a slide. H, X, A means the slide is in Montreal. So I can say, um, I'll just sort of write it abstractly. X is the, G is longer than, so longest slide in Montreal. So again, these are just notes to myself. So now I know that this is a superlative, and it's the longer than relationship, which means it's the longest slide in Montreal. And so I know that X represents the longest slide in Montreal. And there is an A that 
uh, sorry, there is an A that M's the longest slide in Montreal, and there is another A that M's the longest slide in Montreal, and notice that they're different. So all I need to know is what the A and the M mean. A is kid, and M2 is goes down. And now I'm in business. So how many kids are going down the longest slide in Montreal? Here's one. Here's a second. Notice the second is not the same as the first. So this means at least two kids go down the longest slide in Montreal. And that's what that means. So the second part of this sentence was actually a, a quantity statement, but it referred to the X, and the X in the first part of the statement is a superlative referring to longest slides. Translations take a bit of practice, but really they require you just to be good at symbolization. And if you're strong at symbolization, you'll be able to recognize the patterns that we've learned, like superlatives at most, exactly, and at least. And we've covered all those patterns in this example video. And then once you see the pattern, it's not too difficult to just insert the English language into the question.